Welcome. This is the January 4th, 2024 Beehive Production User Call. We have Antranig, Chris, Mark, Andrew, John, Rod, and myself, Michael. And today we have an update from Chris on state tracking, and Antranig has a demo of a project that several of us have been working on. Uh, Chris, go ahead, take over, and I'll stop my share. All right. So, um, let me show you something, I guess. Um, I hope I'm, this is going to work. Um, basically, what I did, I kind of just started um, with the initial problem statement that we already discussed, I don't know, numerous times, about process supervision of Beehive, because I figured Beehive is the easier subset to work on um, when we talk about this Beehive plus jail setting. And... Um, what I have got now is uh, session over here. Basically, what I have here is finally a working program um, that I can show you. And um, basically, it's called VM State D. Um, it's probably not the most uh, smartest name, but. Um, Basically, the idea is that this is a daemon that runs in user space. Um, it's a C program. It's tying in together a couple of libraries that I coded and that basically do the heavy lifting. And VM state D basically is responsible for um, loading configuration files from a directory under user local etc VM state D, where you have uh, one virtual machine, and then you have a, a UCL-based configuration file, which is looking like this, um, very much closely to what a uh, sales conf would look like. And I kind of made a shortcut here because I just basically uh, used the usual Beehive config to actually uh, keep the the, the the VM configuration uh, in one Beehive config file. Obviously, it would be nice to have that in the UCL file, but then we would have to translate the configuration into a Beehive config for Beehive to load in. And that is something that um, I want to revisit later on after I finish the demo, because this is kind of a new problem that kind of occurred to me um, while I was building this. Um, I kind of realized that there is a different problem space that I think we haven't really discussed yet in in much detail, let's say. Um, so just to quickly show you this config file, you probably all know this format. It's just a regular Beehive config. And <clears throat> what, we, what, what this daemon also um, is offering is basically uh, a very simplified... Um, state machine that allows the user to, and I can actually show you in the in the man page, I think. I put that in here somewhere. Basically, there's multiple states that a, a, a VM goes through uh, in its life cycle. And whenever the VM changes state, it basically allows uh, a hook script to run, which is again located in those uh, this APC directory. Uh, so, for example, there is a a start network script and there's a stop network script. And just so you know, this is really just for demo purposes, because what this really does, and obviously again, this is not optimal and this is not um, what users would like, but this just uh, creates a static app. Uh, even though I completely understand this would be created by Beehive anyways. Um, but in this instance, I also added to a bridge interface that is called vSwitch0. And um, this allows the VM then to actually uh, connect to the network. And right when it shuts down, the stop network um, is being run and the stop network again is actually just destroying the tap interface again. As I said before, obviously it would be nice to have that in the UCL config where you just state, I don't know, you want uh, a tap interface, you want that added. It's the usual problem statement that we've discussed also before multiple times, what uh, Jan created MKE pair for. And 
obviously with this uh, with this daemon, it would be possible to have uh, that tied into this uh, workflow system that basically makes sure that either it atomically creates the network or it, it atomically fails. Um, and if it fails, then it cleans up anything in the middle. And um, right, so what can I show you? I can show you how this thing starts and runs. Obviously, there's not much to see except for um, you start, it runs in the background. Um, it actually um, creates a pit file and a socket. And over the socket, you can actually talk to the whole thing. Um, I don't know how much I put in the man page. There's a couple, yeah, there's, there's more variables that you can actually set in the config because the whole idea here is to have something that doesn't just only work on a single machine, but obviously the idea would be to have um, this kind of daemon running on multiple nodes and then use the client utility to get information either from all the nodes or a single node uh, because the, the, the socket code that I implemented was at least built in a fashion that I could replace it with not just a Unix socket, but it could talk over uh, over a uh, TCP socket as well. You guys are putting something in the chat. Um, <laughs> how long did it take? Um, code is not out there yet. Um, I plan to put it out. The idea is I want to put it into a port because I figure um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you know, just put the code out there because then people would have to compile it, build it, and understand how this whole thing works. Even though I want to state that um, I did my best to, if you if look at the make file, I use the, I use the, the usual onboard stuff. So all my make files are using either the BSD prog MK or the lib MK. So you just do make and it does its thing. Um, so let me show you, um, the, the client here really quickly. Um, I don't know if DTL, again, not the smartest name. I completely understand that. The man page, I think, is right. There. Yeah, it's really incomplete, but um, you can basically talk to this thing. Yeah, for example, here it knows that there is a BSD 13 DM. It's, okay, again, demo <laughs> zero is actually it's in, its, in its state. Um, root is the owner. Again, I built it in a fashion, and I'm going to show you the code really quickly later on, because my idea was when I use a Unix socket, I actually can uh, I can read out the, uh, the user ID and the group ID of the connecting user, which would allow me to, for example, say, I don't know, this VM belongs to user, um, I don't know, John XYZ. And when John XYC says he wants to start this VM, he's authorized to do so. So just go ahead. He doesn't need any do as no pseudo. He can just connect with, with the client without any uh, additional authentication. Obviously, this doesn't work over the network. But if you're local, then um, this would be an easy thing to do. So now what I can do here is basically I can tell him start, um, start this VM. It replies with OK. Um, we're not going to see much on uh, the server side, except for maybe in the daemon log. Um, OK, um, maybe I'm going to go back a little further here. You can actually see that he ran uh, the start network script. You can, um, you can hopefully see somewhere that he forked Beehive, and now Beehive is running in the background, hopefully. Um, yes, you can see Beehive. Started with BS BSD 13. Um, I'm not going to log into that machine now because I think that's not what this demo should be about. Um, I think we all can understand this thing is running in the background. Um, I can shut it down now by just saying stop. What this does is basically it issues a term a signal to Beehive and gracefully shuts down the VM. Uh, again, we can watch that happen in daemon log. Um, right, he ran the stop network and uh, Beehive exited, and that's it basically. 
And um, maybe to round this off, let me really quickly start on um, Max over here and show you my code, where at least the, the most critical relevant parts that I want to show you. Um, where is it? We're going to go to this one. Switch the screen over there. Share. Oh. Director. So again, I'm I'm gonna put that out under the BSD uh, license, obviously, and um. And what I'm gonna show you is the KQ KQ stuff because that is I think the most critical idea here. Um, this starts the VM, um, and the idea is basically it puts a, a K event on the PID. So whenever the PID dies or changes or, you know, something happens to the process, we don't have to wait for it. We don't have to watch it. Um, the kernel is going to inform uh, the daemon, okay, this thing happened, and uh, the daemon then basically reacts to whatever happened. Um, the nice thing is the the way I built the the state engine. Uh, maybe I can show you here really quickly. No, it's not in here. It's where is it? Um, no, let me think. Um, is it in here? Oh. Ah, here it is. So basically, that's 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 the general idea of the state engine. And basically, there's a couple of states. Uh, they got names, and those are also the names of the hook scripts. Uh, that the daemon is looking for. So it would be rather easy to add additional states. Um, I also basically constructed, let me show you really quickly, um, a bit of um, a bit of documentation here, additional figures, and I hope I can find that now. Right here it is. So again, you can tell I'm old school. But if it works, it ain't stupid. Here is xfig, and this is basically uh, what the states look like at the moment. And I intentionally split out a restart cycle from a regular startup cycle because I figured with a restart, we want to keep maybe want to keep uh, the network and not tear down network and storage. Um, unless, I don't know, that makes sense, but then someone could still have a symlink with the same name pointing to the, um, to the, to the regular other hook scripts. Is it, um, uh, right. I want to, I want to interject here something and you, uh, I, yeah, I, I really like what I'm seeing, but it's mainly a comment about how you've got a separate shell script for every one of these stage functions. And in the model of etsyrc.d, I think it might be better to, instead of having start under bar network and stop under bar network, have network and call it with arguments, start, stop, restarting, restopping. Which, so that it, it th there's commonality in what you're gonna be doing. And so if it were, and, and just to, to have the, So I'm just thinking of using more of the model of, of how etsyrc.ds are done, and it mm -hmm. would it would uh, greatly expand the capabilities in that, I mean, you could not only have start, stop, restart, restopping, you could have enables and disables mm -hmm. and status and, yep. and all sorts of things. Plus, you've already got an existing framework of somebody has written all that code. So you can even, you can build dependency trees, um, you can you can run a uh, I'm trying to remember how you do it. There's a, a RC order that can mm -hmm. tell you yeah, yeah, what, exactly. order, what order these things are going to happen in. And that's when this this state machine you got here is pretty complete. But I know evolution is going to greatly yeah. complicate <laughs> that thing in the future. Yeah. And then one last oh, thing. Yeah. And that you've written a simple state machine. In the code that if you if you look at it it's basically driven by a bunch of textual arguments that call function names 
it would right. be possible. It would it be possible to read that from a configuration file so that the state machine itself becomes data. Mm -hmm. I, it's that's that's a bigger ask. That's harder to do, but um, that is harder to do. Yeah, <laughs> it, that's that, harder to do. It's possible. I agree. Yeah. It, that's an extremely flexible mechanism in a program, but I yeah. don't think you need it now. But I. I foresee that happening to it in the future. The positive thing is I think the, the way I've built it, it could be replaced reasonably easily. Um, I kind of, you know, I weighed my options in, in terms of I wanted to have something working and complete at a reasonable pace. Um, as Anthony pointed out, how much time did I spend on that? I actually, <laughs> I locked my time. It took me 40 hours, around about 40 hours. Um, so it was some time investment, but at the end of the day, I think it's still for what I got out of it. I think it's actually quite nice. In my opinion, this absolutely isn't perfect at all. Um, it, it isn't a workable state. It would need a lot more polishing, uh, and, and probably also testing error, error handling and stuff like that. Actually, I should probably also show you, um, because I'm kind of, that is something Probably also why why this why this took so much time here, um, because a lot of the a lot of the code that I built here, um, I don't know, uh, it's picked up stock. It doesn't really matter. I I also built test cases, you know. So um, all that stuff here, um, and okay, actually, apparently some of the tests are already broken for whatever reason. Um, it's the usual demo situation, I guess. Uh, yeah, okay. This one's not going to fly, I think. But, um, watch. let's go with this one. Next thing. But basically, I can I can run through my tests and, and do regression tests and everything. And this obviously is also um, very time consuming, but it is, at least for me, it was very helpful to, to, to ensure that whatever I was building was working. And in a workable state, when I tied it together, uh, um, and again, I basically just um, when you look at the make files, um, this is this is it. Yeah, this is all. This is all just usual usual uh, test make file, and 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 it, and it works. So in that sense, FreeBSD is great in my opinion. Um, great. What else? Um, there was one more thing I just wanted to say about, yeah, the evolution of the, the state machine. Uh, you, I, I, I agree 100%. Um, Jan also pointed it out recently, and that is one of the reasons why Jan is such a, such a proponent and an advocate of S6RC, I think, because he says this basically allows him to um, build something that is so flexible that the user can just define and decide whatever state machine and whatever states he he would have to uh, he would he would like basically and i started out with the uh, with the assumption and obviously this is a very um extreme assumption that basically it might be better to have something that works 80 percent of the time or for 80 percent of the use cases and would help people to you know get jump started um and yeah okay <laughs> and um and um and Nonetheless, there would be 20% of people that that would not um, would not be happy with whatever states I put in. Uh, nonetheless, you're making a very valid point that um, it might be wiser to switch this um, to um, to a mo to a model that basically uses parameters or, or calling arguments. Um, and um, I was just thinking of something else that I wanted to say, but I forgot. Um, Oh, right. Um, what I was also thinking, um, what would also obviously be very helpful is if if I were to add uh, environment variables that are set with additional information about the VM that is actually calling those scripts, then it will be possible for users, for example, to um, maybe even simplify things uh, even further because that they can abstract the script into something with just having a VM name parameter or something, and then you have one script for, I don't know, 50, 50 VMs that do all the same stuff. Um, but again, 
I didn't do that yet because yeah, programming takes time as we all know, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think I think what you've done here is it is usable. This is this is you know, how soon are you gonna ship it? You've you've already you've already uh, I, you've already gone far enough to create a very usable tool. And just because exactly. there's like to be done, don't let that stop you from shipping it. Yeah, that that, that is my idea as well. Um I think I can I can probably get this done somewhere around January and February. I, I definitely want to get it done sooner uh, than later. Actually, let me show you some something as well. Um, just because again, um, maybe you have additional ideas, guys. Um, and I think I think get it there now. Basically, I have I have already set up a milestone in my GitLab um, for all the stuff that I still need to do. Um, before I have a ready and working port. And um, hold on a second. Um, okay, it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Here we are. Um, come on. Sorry for keeping you with this. I'm going to be here in a second. And now we should get a screen. What is it? What is this? Oh, here we go. And it's still loading, still loading, still loading. Okay, here we are. Um, so here we are. And um, actually, just to, so you understand why this is called BI proxy, I, this I kind of started this with a completely different premise, because originally I was thinking about building something that basically sits on the network, something like INSD, that is listening for ports and starts a VM on demand when traffic comes in and suspends it again when there is no traffic coming coming in. That was the original idea that I started out from, and this is <laughs> what it is now. Um, and you'll see this, so basically, I need to build a port, a make file. Um, I want to clean up the man pages. Uh, I need to create an RCD script, and there is, yeah, the lip state handler is actually not completely thread safe. Um, so I want to put in some, some mutex um, just to make sure that there isn't something that breaks in the back. And once I have that done, so basically you can see, I think this should all be manageable to get completed somewhere around January and February at the latest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So any other questions or input ideas? What I can basically say, um, I, I, I learned I learned a bunch from doing this. Um, the first thing that I learned, oh, actually, there's one more thing I can share with you guys. Um, and I would like to hear what your take on that is because I, I got the idea basically uh, and well it's not a new idea basically um, I would want to put um, I would want to put the configuration to the UCL file it's the, the, the usual problem you know and then convert that into the BI config as I said before and I realized that there's always going to be configurations that are going to be so complex that users will still need to have a beehive config that is not tied into the UCL config. I don't know, I was thinking of a pass-through or different other options that, that might be, you know, until we actually get there that the UCL is able to, to represent all that kind of configuration space, uh, we would have to have a middle ground. And then we would have a situation where, I don't know, uh, we would have, uh, let's say, a console defined in the UCL, but the console also defined in the VI config because maybe the user made a mistake, uh, and then they might be competing for the same slot on the PCI bus, and um, and then we need to, you know, and then we're back to square one, let's say, because one of the key points that came out of the enterprise working group was also that um, it's difficult to troubleshoot VI because the errors that you get from the system are well, hard to digest at some point. <laughs> and um, so, I'm sorry. Um, come again? I'm sorry, I laughed when you said that. Well, I mean, 
I'm, I mean that I mean that in in uh, in the usual sense that um, if you know the tool, you know where to look at. Um, if you're new, then it's the usual problem. Um, where where do you start? How do you how do you get um, what's what's happening? And um, I actually where did I put that? I, yeah, here it is. So basically, I started to draft something. You know, and, and this is again incomplete because I realized maybe people want more than one console. Um and um maybe they want more bridges, maybe they want uh and, and how do you how do you define that? So I'm I'm now in the space where I'm attempting to figure out and this is basically what Mike call uh push Jan the last time, how do you define a UCL uh schema that could work and I have is it coming out of the work that I did? Yeah, sure, sure. On the on the on the schema, um, uh, you know, on the Solaris side, I've been using ZADM to uh, to more or less manage zones. So there's there's Zone Atom, and then there's ZADM, which is a newer tool that's being developed by some of the Solaris folks here on, on the Omni OS side. Um, I can show you quickly how what a they're doing it in basically JSON format, and I can kind of give you. Uh, oh. I'll put it in chat here an example of a VM and how they define the VMs um, before they spin it up. So I want to make sure. Based right or not zones, mm -hmm. uh, VMs based on a configuration file. Yeah, so yeah. All your tool is right. Okay. Um, right. Let me, it's not letting me copy paste. One second. Uh, of course, one second. It's going to be a second longer. But yeah, I was, uh, I'll give you the example here in chat in just a second. But I was uh, curious, okay. what's the difference? What is UCL exactly? Like, I've never heard of that before. What's the difference between like that and JSON? Uh, UCL and it is is that yeah, it is it is it is close to JSON, but it is more relaxed. I would say um, it is a little bit more graceful in terms of uh, syntax errors. Um, so as you can, it's actually the you continuation. Can use is the, the continuation okay. of, the NG, is of the nginx file format, as mm -hmm. in uh, JSON style, Nginx. yeah, as in JSON styling, but with the XML goodies. So it has types, yeah. integers, boolean, etc. Can use the variables. I don't know. It's, it's quite it's quite powerful actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it also has some other cool features as well. That. Um, it it has a schema validation, if I remember correctly, similar to uh, what's his name, similar to XML. I don't I don't think that JSON supports uh, uh, schema validation, at, at least based on the standards. There there are tools that can validate, but I don't think that the standard has a, a validation mechanism in there. So uh, yeah, and and we use UCL a lot internally in FreeBSD. Some of us. Don't even know that we're using it like in in visual functions for IOCTL, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, this is a very nice XML. Uh, sorry, very nice uh, JSON. JSON, yeah. Yeah, so what okay, I oh, you're talking cool. about what, what he has there, and are you talking about what I just put in or what he has in his, on what he's sharing? The one that you sent into the chat, which is. Yeah, uh, so yeah, this is a standard format that ZADM uses. Um, there's mm -hmm. also a format that the original. Uh, Zone Atom uses, which I can give you that, and it's a lot more different. Uh, one second. Let's open big. Yeah, oh, Chris, the, the, the one you in Zone Atom. Sorry. I'm sorry. Someone else was talking. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, sorry, sorry. My bad. I just wanted to say that the, uh, internally, Zone Atom converts the JSON to XML anyway because legacy. You know. <laughs> yeah. So this, the first yeah. thing I put there, that's the Zone Atom version of it, and this is. Oh, it's going to be too long. I have to break this up. Uh, and this is what the actual OS is using under the hood with the, the core zone atoms and config services. So the thing above, the uh, JSON is broken down into this zone like uh, where it has all these attributes and things. So it's a lot more. Okay. The JSON is a lot easier to read. So yeah, uh, compared, to, compared to the old way of doing it. So I, I was just trying to. If, if you have another OS or system you want to emulate how they're doing their definitions of zones, I would recommend the ZADM method of how they have these, these, this, using JSON here. That does look cool, yeah. I'm just going to put this on really quickly. Thank you. 
I feel inspired. I will get you a man page to ZADM as well. So that way you can take some hints from them if that helps. Because they're also managing Absolutely. Beehive and LX zones. Now they're, it's more for zones in general, not necessarily just Beehive, but it, it, it applies uh -huh. to Beehive zones. So. Okay, just um, just to be on the safe side, um, how is the licensing? If I look at this thing, um, because I don't, I, I rather want to have this clean uh, clean room space than uh, you know, getting now they're getting using GPL three with ZADM. Okay, really? Uh, I thought I thought it would be CDDL or something like that. I mean, looking at the GitHub page, the very top it says GPL dash three point oh license. Wow, I would never I just expect it... that from. Uh... Okay, I mean uh, the file format. I think that's that's fine. I mean, um, if if I don't use the code that reads it, I think I should be I should be okay. Yeah, all right. And I don't even know if the code's gonna be one to one, but the ideas, yeah, at least might be able to look into. It. It's like, oh, it's using you know JSON as their underlying file format. That's you, you can't no, they can't mm -hmm. prevent you from using JSON as your your configuration file. Yeah. But they could probably yeah. say yeah. you can't use this script that we use to parse our JSON files. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. yeah, that's fine. Um, great, um, John. Um, you wanted to say something previously. I, I just wanted to offer a couple comments. Um, you mentioned the uh, enterprise meetings uh, uh, there a little while ago, and as I'm as I'm looking at this, we're talking about a, a data storage format, and it's an excellent technical question. I would offer up that the 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 flip side of this whole thing is, you, let's say you now have a hundred users of your of your code. And how do you present this to them? Do they, uh, in all honesty, from my perspective, do they care what is going under the, under the covers or do they want the most simplistic mechanism possible to be able to uh, bring VMs up, bring them down, make, uh, you know, redefine the amount of RAM or redefine the networking and then and bring it back up? And I, I, and I say this because I have found myself in a world of where I'm a I'm a techie, right? And I, I love solving technical problems. And then I get a hundred users who couldn't care about what I've done unless they can type in this one liner and have it and have it do what they want. Have it work. Yeah. Uh -huh. And this well, it's, it's, just, it's just a it's a it's a comment. And I've I have found that for and I don't know your code. I haven't looked at it. So there's there, there's absolutely nothing here about your about statement about your code. I have found that I try to use a a mechanism where I have a uh, a non-determinate data storage format for uh, options. So foo equals bar. Mm -hmm. And when I read foo in, I set a value. And if someone needs a new value, a new option, then, then I read in foo. And then I look dynamically to see if there is a foo validator function. If there is, I call it to validate the value that was passed in. And then on the backside, when I convert, when we convert foo into a beehive option, and in my case, it's beehive or QEMU, and then we have a, a function for foo to convert the value of bar into whatever it needs to be for beehive or QEMU. Um, and I, I don't actually save my values or anything in a, in a, in a, target state format. Um, I almost purposely don't. I offer that up because you've got some really nice stuff here and it, it could go a long ways. Um, yes, I. Um, uh, you're making a, a, a valid point. Um, the way I thought it, it, it's kind of sure that there's always going to be people who are unhappy either, either way. Um, either it's not... <laughs> It's not customizable enough, or either, or, or or other. On the other hand, it's not um, it's not easy enough. Um, I guess I guess that's the crux of, of any kind of development. Um, on the other hand, with the with the storage format, I mean that's quite interesting. Um, so those variables that you're setting, uh, do I understand this correctly? You would also basically you would tie those to a virtual machine.
John, you're muted. You're speaking. Ah, yes, I'm muted. I there we go. Is that better? Yes. Uh, yeah, I read I read values in that are not in a Beehive or QEMU format, and you know mm -hmm. define the RAM to be sixteen gig, whatever you want it to be. Um, and then we have a, for instance, a RAM validator function that will take that and put it into a internal format that we're happy with. And then if we mm -hmm. generate a Beehive machine or a QEMU machine, we then have an output format function that takes the that internal RAM value uh -huh. and converts it into either a Beehive format or QEMU format option for whether it's a it command line option or that. into a config file. That is very smart, yes. Um, yeah, I might, I might want to adopt that. I think when I uh, when I do this, because um, basically what I was thinking about was constructing something that kind of understands a beehive config, is kind of aware of the different options, in the hopes to be able to produce better warnings and error messages whenever there's configuration errors. But on the other hand, um, your approach is really great because if we abstract that, then basically whatever we build in terms of configuration, it could be used for, as you said, for QAMU VMs, for Beehive VMs, it, it, it wouldn't matter for jails even, maybe at, at the end of the day at some point. Um, and actually, that brings me back to one more point, and this is kind of an overlap to or a throwback to yesterday's call, because as I um, as I've shown you, um, I started on with Beehive particularly for the reason because there's already code in the kernel that allows me to use K events for for process watching or process, mm -hmm. process supervision. In my opinion. It should be reasonably straightforward to put additional kernel events um, uh, on particular points of the life cycle of a jail. So whenever a jail is instantiated, whenever a jail dies, um, it, it should be fairly straightforward to, to issue uh, AQ events for, for those instances. So if we manage to um, get that into the kernel, then basically exactly the same approach that I built here would be possible to apply also for, for, for jails. Um, then again, I don't know how much um, how much work that would actually mean in, I don't know, in terms of actual development testing, getting people to approve it, review it, and so on and so forth. But, um, right. And, and what I'm also unsure, to be honest, even though I've heard it now a couple of times, is how much how many users are actually interested in handling uh, a VM like a jail and vice versa? And maybe uh, maybe Mark, you can you can say something about that because my understanding is zones are something like that. You can kind of switch that back and forth, right? I'm not really too versed in the, the underworkings of zones versus jails. Um, from what I understand, a zone is pretty much a jail, but it has the beehive process running inside of it. Um, so I, I really, I think Andrew actually might be able to speak more to the underlying as to the difference between zones and jails. But um, okay, the, in regards to the like the user base, like who's like the, I think the question is if they want to be able to like go ahead and pass. I I, I didn't have a complete sentence there. You're good. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> didn't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Trig has had his hand up for a while. I think he has something uh, to add. Mm. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, yeah. Hello. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it got me thinking that now there are two very common formats that people use. One of them is um, uh, what's oh great, my connection's dead. Great, good job, connection. Okay, are you back, connection? Okay, connection is back. Great. Okay. So um, yes. one of them is um, OVA that's that was created by VMware like a decade or two ago. Now it's used literally everywhere, a virtual box, um, 
VMware solutions. All of them support the OVA standard, which is an open standard. And there are tools in base that can convert things back and forth. Uh, it also relies on Chemu tools because OVA historically has been dependent on either VHDK, v VMDK, VMDK, or the other one that ESXi uses, uh, unlike ours, which we use, you know, raw files. That, that's one option. And the, another one that's gaining popularity, although it's not that popular yet, is the uh, .UTM format for the UTM application on macOS. Thanks to the spread of Apple Silicon, uh, everyone wants to run VMs, so they use... Um, the UTM app, which is basically a, a uh, what do you call that? A uh, a nice wrapper around Chemu uh, for Apple Silicon, and the UTM approach is more like the um, the .dot app approach on macOS. So it's basically a directory, which inside of it has a logo of the you know of the VM because people apparently use GUIs, and it also has um, a configuration file, um, which is in JSON. Oh, great. My connection is gone again. Okay, now it's back again. Great. Um, so they also have that. And it's been working very well, as in you can not just configure the basics such as tune tap, etc. And they also have even more advanced stuff in their um, JSON file format, such as um, you know, vendor, if you want to be more vendor specific, or you can even have things like what kind of drivers to use. So like it, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty clean format. Um, I mean, I'm not saying we should we should make them our default, but maybe our utilities, whether being Super V or a VM State D, etc., can have a way to like you know Super V export to to an OVA, and the same also is to do Super V import from an OVA file, right? So um, again, managing VMs like these standards is going to be a lot simpler than what we're discussing over on the jails calls, which is supporting OC, the OCI format. That's a whole different massive topic by itself. So th that's the only thing I wanted to point out is that like there are already, you know, industry standards for shipping virtual machine images. Um, uh, there's also another one by uh, Microsoft, uh, although I think they these days they only ship. Well, at the beginning, they only shipped the disk. Now the disk can also contain metadata about the uh, uh, the VM itself, so its configuration. So that's also VHD. Good. Yeah, with the VHD, yeah, the new VHD format. Yep. And the VHDX also... is with the metadata, yes. right? Yeah, the VHDX also contains the metadata. They call it the type two with disk or type two, whatever that they call it. So those are also, and they are all open formats. So it's either, you know, something with a zip or something with a tar, depending on which one it is. So it's, it's uh, they also might be interesting ones to manage. And again, we have the 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 tools in in, in ports and packages anyway. Uh, it is most of the Chemu utilities managing them, so uh, that might be interesting. It also might be interesting to ship them from like FreeBSD releases. I don't think we we'll ship OVA images uh, to users, but that that might also be interesting to ping uh, release engineering to release an OVA of FreeBSD, so someone can just import with all the settings correctly and you know, uh, with, with the logo and everything. So that, that might be another idea as well. I think they already ship a couple of those platforms. Yes. There are VMs. Yeah. There's another format out there storing this uh, for Vagrant. They use .box files, which is basically a VDI file or a VMDK and a, and a tar file zipped with some metadata. And that's how I use for Solaris or sorry, on, on OmniOS, how I spin up my beehive zones with Vagrant. So I just haven't had the time to port it to FreeBSD. So I will have been able to share my work with you guys because I don't have too much use at work for FreeBSD, unfortunately. I use OmniOS everywhere. That's a good excuse that you have to work with OmniOS everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not that I, I would I would love to port it, and then I would be able to like maybe we would be able to share some of the the things I implemented in the plugin I made mm -hmm. for Vagrant into your guys' VM State D or the other app you guys were showing the other day on the other Beehive call that I missed. Yeah, and and for those who were asking about the um, the zones jails uh, perspective, we had a long conversation about this. I think when we started the jails call, um, the zones by definition are very similar to jails except that they have this concept of a brand that's actually an, an abstraction. On the kernel layer, everything is a container. Um, so the, in the brand, you can either define a Linux brand, which means it's going to install a Linux rootfs inside of it, 
with that bootstrap or whatever tools that they're using, depending on the um, of a Lumos distribution. Each of them have their own way. Or it can be with uh, a Beehive brand, which is basically a zone, so a jail, that's running Beehive inside of it. That's that's the other brand. There is There are also other brands depending on the Illumos uh, distribution. Uh, so um, I think some of them support images for their brands. Um, basically, they're, 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 there's different depending on the, whether it's SmartOS or OmniOS or the other solutions. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Omni, uh, Illumos overall got that uh, writer, as in everything is a, a zone, AKA a container. And inside of it, we decide if it's going to be a root FS of a file system of an, an operating system, uh, or if it's going to be a single process as in Beehive running a whole uh, virtual machine. Um, I think there's also KVM, but correct me if do, I don't, do you guys yeah, still is. use KVM? Or did uh, everyone there's use a, Beehive? There's a few use cases for it. Um, for like CentOS 6 that we can't necessarily like update because the repos are all gone now uh we yeah. we can convert some of them to kvm and still have the vnc display that we need for our clients mm -hmm. so yes and no we don't use it in production but we can um so there's some use case for it i wouldn't say it's very common yeah that that was a massive work by these smart os guys like a decade ago which kind of went under the water after the beehive came came to be i guess now that everyone's moved to beehive kind of But yeah, that was Linux's KVM. Um, uh, Avi's team was doing it at Red Hat, and then SmartOS's guys brought that code into uh, in, in, into Illumos. Um, so yeah. On the FreeBSD version of Beehive, is it possible to hot swap disks? Like, let's say you have a VM running, so that way that way you don't have to turn. Like, let's say you have a, a server, you can't turn off a MySQL server or MS SQL server, and you need to restore one of the databases. So you have your Z, you have it on a ZFS backup. Is there any way that you'd be able to you know, you'd be able to clone the back the, the snapshot to its own file system? But how would you hot mount that to the same VM without? Like, we have a problem internally where whenever we switch to Beehive we weren't able to, like VirtualBox allowed us to add another disk while the VM was running. Beehive doesn't let you do that on Solaris as easily as far as I'm aware. Is there any mechanism on FreeBSD that allows you to do that? So I, I, think, the, that... I, I think the same mechanism can be used on Illumos as well, which is you can use Virt.io with uh, SCSI and you can attach it to a SCSI uh, provider on FreeBSD. We have uh, CTLD. Uh, I think you also have something similar in Illumos as well, which is in the, an, an iSCSI uh, pro provider, and Beehive becomes a consumer of it. Uh, what you do is you do the disk management on the uh, iSCSI server side, the provider side, instead of on the Beehive side. So that also might be an option to do uh, that. And then okay. inside of the BM itself, just, just mount it from the iSCSI server that way? Exactly. Uh, so what you're saying? Okay. No, 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 that that is one option to to mount it to mount the SCSI from inside of the VM. But as far as I know, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Beehive can also mount the SCSI itself, right? And and display it as a disk to the uh, uh, host operating system to the guest operating system. So Vert IO SCSI is simply a SCSI bus that is pluggable, and. CTL lets you send just about anything at it via the disk image or raw disk, you aim it. And uh, his work was pretty impressive there. So um, let's put that on the list of things to work on. Uh, y y Jan's been, uh, the connection, great. Y Jan's been sick uh, lately. Uh, hopefully he'll be back next week. And uh, when he comes back, we'll, Ask him on how he did on how we did his implementation. I'm sorry, Ma Zoom tells us my connection is unstable, but uh, <clears throat> I'll ping Jan over the weekend to get more more info about that. Okay, wonderful. Sorry to interrupt. That was the topic I probably should have written down in the minute meeting minutes there. No worries about. So that gives me a lot of good ideas. So uh, thank you. I can I can work with that in the meantime.
what it doesn't do is explicitly help you on Illumos, but let's see, you know, what is the state of Virta does you perhaps it probably has the driver and you might even just see it listed in the VM. So lots of options. Or in the three hive manual page, actually I can probably answer that right now. Let's take a look. Other topics? Is my headset working? It was being weird there for a second. I'm looking at your Burt IO devices. Interesting. No Burt IO scissors, so that's something to look into. There's a Burt IO block, BLK. But I don't think that's the same, so. But But I can still use probably other SCSI mechanisms to get around that. Not, you know, I like I said, mount it inside of the VM instead of from at the Beehive level. So it gives me options still. Right. I'm I'm wondering why wouldn't you use NFS in a scenario like that? Uh, Multi-tenant uh, host. So we can create any number of private VLANs because we have software-defined networking on it. But um, mm -hmm. uh, we we can't uh, like we don't want to open up NFS. To, like we, we don't have enough like we don't want to put the host which is on our management network on to our customers be like which runs the vms which on our separate it, it would be mixing that mixing customer base with our core infrastructure and we don't want to do that Got it. okay that makes sense and uh, uh can i also ask how are you doing software defined networks Aspo, uh solaris is uh i think they uh, the the Oracle team came up with it like 20, 2007. Uh, I'll put a white paper. I've shared it before here, but it is a wonderful, wonderful technology inside of uh, OmniOS. Yes, um, yes. We, we envy you that we don't have that. Yeah, I love Crossbow. <laughs> it makes it makes life really easy. Like a home home networking, I can set up VLANs without having a switch that supports it. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> Yeah, don't don't network. I can't find the white paper at the moment. I had it bookmarked, but I'll put it in the in the meeting minutes after if I find it. We we had we had the thought that our net graph would be a cross crossbow style networking, but uh, configuring net graph is hard. I mean, it it can do the same thing that crossbow can, but configuring it is very 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 complex compared to what we thought that it would be. Uh, so yeah, that's that's I I think uh, crossbow. Uh, maybe maybe I, I I don't think we can port crossbow. God knows, there's a lot of Illumosi stuff in there. That's for sure. Yeah, between the aggregates and then running, you know, all the VLAN with the Mac. Yeah, it, there's mm -hmm. it's a lot different than than traditional networking. I can tell you that. So. <laughs> to Daniel's little netcraft helper to the stop. Some of us put it, but still, they're apples and oranges. Entirely. So. Well, great uh, work here's, the white, great. here's the white paper. Oh, where's chat? Great. Well, anything else? Well, I say thank you, everyone. Keep up the good work, Chris, and let's all just make this happen. Okay, well, I will let you guys go. See you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Excellent Thank work. you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> no Happy network problem can ever stop you from saying that. Yes.
Okay, how do I do that? 